Go ahead. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, welcome to the second session of the Neurosymbolic Learning Systems. And today we have two distinguished speakers, uh, Henry Kotz and Amit Seth. And both of them are fellows of uh, the AAAI, AAAS, and ACM. Uh, uh, it's pretty uh, distinguished honors. And uh, Henry is uh, with the National Science Foundation now, is the director of the IIS division, Information uh, Intelligent Information Systems Division, I believe, under the Science Directorate at National Science Foundation. And, and he's also a professor of the Department of Computer Science at University of Rochester. Uh, Amit Seth is uh, a professor at, uh, is a chair professor at uh, University of South Carolina. Uh, and uh, prior to that, he was at Wright State University. So without much ado, uh, I will uh, turn it over to Henry Kautz to talk about uh, the taxonomy of neurosymbolic systems, which will be followed by Amit, who will be talking about uh, how knowledge graphs and uh, and the neurosymbolic and, 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 the, and, and the neural systems. So uh, we have approximately 30 minutes of talk and about 15 minutes for question answering for each of the talks. And Henry, thank you. I'm turning it over to you. And the people who are not talking, except for Henry, everyone else, if you are on mute, that will be good. And there's also a chat. Uh, you can put your notes on the chat uh, page. Okay, and your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rob. So this talk uh, grows out of my effort to understand what we mean by neurosymbolic systems. And I, as I read more and more papers, I realized that very different approaches all fell under this general banner of neurosymbolic. And I call it towards a taxonomy because every time I read a new paper or give this talk, I think of some different categories. It's, it's still a a growing um, uh, genre. I found it useful to think about how neurosymbolic reasoning grew out of long established traditions in the, the history of AI. <clears throat> uh, you're all familiar with the fact that AI has gone through ups and downs in terms of expectations, commercialization, and, and government support that we call AI summers and winters. So in each summer, people think they, well, they have a shiny new tool. It works on some problems and till it doesn't. And then there's this period of disillusionment, uh, but eventually people realize, well, we can combine these new ideas uh, with some older ideas and actually get some kind of a productive systems. So let's turn back to the very first AI summer in the 1950s and 60s, where the groundwork, for what we now call a neurosymbolic systems was laid. And this is the traditions in AI of artificial neural nets um, as exemplified by Frank uh, Rosenblatt's work and on symbolic reasoning that one could exemplify, say is exemplified by uh, McCarthy's work. And they seem to be pretty incompatible traditions. And in fact, they went on uh, in parallel. One for, for decades, symbolic reasoning was dominant. And now of course, artificial neural networks are dominant, but there's an increasing uh, uh, agreement that we need to combine aspects of both approaches. The second uh, summer and then into the early second winter uh, is sometimes given the slogan, knowledge is power. So this is the birth of expert systems, uh, systems from, uh, that are often associated with the, the group led by Ed Feigenbaum for uh, knowledge engineering systems, um, Mycin, a early medical system, XCON, uh, which really led to a, a boom in commercialization of AI that was a con expert 
configuration system used by the Digital Equipment uh, Corporation. But the key idea here is that um, it's not just a matter of a, a few neurons that need a little training or a few axioms you're going to write down in logic, that you need a lot of stuff, a lot of knowledge about the world. So as um, the expert system boom was uh, starting to peter out, the, the big problem became, how do you gain all of those, um, all that knowledge? And it was, became clear that it was not going to be feasible to manually encode it all. And I think that led fairly directly into the, this field that really grew up during the, the second uh, winter in the 80s, uh, we would call that knowledge induction, getting knowledge from examples or more commonly machine learning. And so when we look at the 80s, we see, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, two of the, the big pieces that, that make up machine learning. Uh, so Bayesian Networks by Perl, which captured the idea that uh, machine learning really is about reasoning under uncertainty and that one can apply, one can use um, graphical notation to, uh, to compactly uh, represent complex probability distributions and the uh, dependencies and independencies between the variables. So it's interesting is, is when you look at, at Bayesian networks, and then you, you look at, at neural networks, yes, they are not doing, they're not exactly the same, uh, but I think there are, um, there are, you know, more, there are more similarities than is commonly recognized. Uh, the, the other big idea, I put down decision tree learning, and sometimes uh, this is, uh, decision trees are considered sort of old fashioned. Well, I, I know because I do a lot of, of, of uh, practical work in data science, it'd be embarrassing to call it um, AI, uh, because uh, systems, uh, these basic systems like decision trees are, act, are often the most useful. And what decision trees capture really is the, the, uh, the, the notion of, um, of information and entropy, right? That, that decision trees in, in the way the algorithms are learning are based on this notion of, of minimizing the, the entropy of the output. And uh, I, I suspect that someone who uh, is perhaps a little bit more mathematically inclined than myself might see analogies or, or, or show formal analogies uh, to neural networks which can be viewed as uh, neuronetic learning as a process of energy minimization. Then of course, the, the third AI summer is the deep learning revolution that was really kicked off in 2012 when AlexNet um, trounced all the other approaches to computer vision in the ImageNet um, a challenge, so showing dramatically um, uh, lower error rates, going from uh, 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 you know 2010 to 2011, where you were looking at error rates that, that says there the alert error rates for shallow networks, but in fact the error rates for whatever were the state of the art methods, 26 percent down, 10 points to 16 percent, and of course we now have um, four specific tasks uh, like the ImageNet challenge, less than human error. But of course, we, we should always be aware that, you know, as, as researchers, we're, we're aware that that all has to be taken with a grain of sand, a grain of salt, not a grain of sand, grain of salt, uh, because it's, it's uh, rather artificial conditions being presented, um, uh, clear images, of individual objects, you know, in, in the center of the frame. So people, in fact, are, are, are still vastly superior for general 
object recognition in dynamic scenes, highly occluded um, uh, scenes and so forth uh, than uh, computers. So what made um, uh, deep learning uh, so powerful uh, beyond what was already there in the neural networks in the, 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 the 50s? Well, the, the, not, the explicit knowledge representation or symbolic uh, 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 paradigm was all about uh, capturing relationships often in the form of hierarchies. So part whole hierarchies, action, sub-step hierarchies, and so on. And this is just a, I thought I'd throw in a, a picture from, from my own PhD thesis in the far distant past of a, a knowledge engineered hierarchy for, for making pasta. Um, uh, well, so what deep learning added was what they call representation learning or, or learning hierarchies. So not just features and classes as in sort of pre-deep learning uh, machine learning, but um, uh, taking in low level features and automatically generating the, the more complicated features. Uh, that again, before deep learning, those more complicated features were essentially uh, engineered by hand. Even if you had a general machine learning system, you still would write special programs to combine features into higher level representations. I, and another powerful part of deep learning that I think is, is sometimes overlooked is that uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's, it's the only really satisfactory approach to um, capturing concept similarity, that the use of distributed representations or what are called vector-based representations directly support concept uh, similarity. You can have, if a concept is a vector of, of, of weights, then the, uh, the, the cosine uh, of those, between those uh, two vectors uh, is their similarity, very remarkably simple. And of course, this gives the um, examples we know of such that uh, cats are like kittens, um, a little bit similar to dogs, but uh, you know, quite far from things like, like houses. And you can even uh, do some uh, algebraic operations such that uh, a queen minus woman plus man equals king. And the, the only system that um, really tried to deal with a similarity before this, and I think in a serious way, was uh, fuzzy logic, Lato Zeta's uh, fuzzy logic. But fuzzy logic really could not handle uh, different kinds of similarities along different dimensions. So, so this, is, this is, I think, one of the big breakthroughs and why deep learning is so useful in the real world, where so much of our reasoning is, is not um, logical and it's not even probabilistic. It's about similarity, right? So that if, if you're, you, you're, you know that, um, uh, you know, if, 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 you're, if your child wants a, um, a kitten, you, you will probably do pretty well if you've got her a cat maybe less well if you got her a dog, but probably pretty bad if you got her a, a house. And those, those kinds of degrees of similarity I said, is, is, is sort of baked in to deep learning. So um, uh, a couple of years ago, there were uh, some what I call Twitter wars um, uh, between uh, uh, Mitch Marcus and Jan LeCun and um, uh, Marcus <clears throat> wrote a book, as you all know, criticizing a lot of, of deep learning and uh, calling for a uh, uh, need for AI systems to perform symbolic reasoning. And uh, there were some responses by Jan LeCun, which essentially said, yeah, we've been working on that for quite a few years, combining 
uh, symbolic and uh, neural representations. So I think there's this sort of violent agreement on the need to bring together uh, the traditions of, of the neural and symbolic traditions. And uh, what we don't yet know is, is, so what does that, what is that mixture? Which, which is the one that uh, uh, will be the most successful? Um, and I guess you can talk about most successful in different ways. You can talk about being most successful as in practical terms. It, it simply allows you to build the most useful systems. Of course, another sense of most successful is it gives you the deepest understanding of intelligence and of, of, of general intelligence that, would, that encompasses both the brain and machine intelligence. And the answers in fact might be different. There might be an approach that is actually most, um, maybe perhaps least biologically plausible, but most useful in, in uh, practice. So I think when I first came up with my list, I had five uh, uh, different categories. I've added, I added a sixth and um, I've received email about people pointing out, well, what about uh, seven and eight? So I just would like to offer this as a, as a starting point. And perhaps there also are cases where some of these distinctions I'm making could be collapsed. So the first I would call um, the deep learning standard operating procedure. And uh, I would say this is the mainstream view of neurosymbolic uh, reasoning uh, as, as you know, viewed by, for example, Jan LeCun and, and, and uh, uh, Jeff Hinton. And the idea here is that symbols arise because um, we need to communicate and act in the world. So uh, we need to actually deal with either words or we need to deal with particular objects which can be represented by particular symbols but that everything in the middle are uh, these sort of these vector representations and uh, uh, neural and neural network architectures of various uh, uh, sorts. Now this picture shows a feed forward network, but of course it need not be a feed forward network. One could have um, all kinds of interesting um, uh, recurrent uh, networks and long, short, short long-term memory units and, and, and so on. But the, the basic idea is that we start out with some object out there in the world, let's say a document. There's a pre-processing step where the words are converted into, into vectors, right? And we do this through um, programs like word to vec or its uh, successors. And yeah, that's, that's what's called a dense embedding of, uh, of these symbols. Uh, we could also have as inputs, of course, uh, raw pixels, in which case we essentially don't need to do the processing. We uh, uh, just go directly to the in, uh, uh, dense embedding. Uh, but in other cases, we have we might have um, uh, more symbolic-like inputs, even if they're visual, that still need to be turned into dense embedding. So, if you think of, for example, a, a chessboard, um, the 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 initial inputs are essentially the the positions on the um, the pieces on the board, and they seem nicely discrete but you might project those into that, that whole chessboard into a dense embedding. Okay, and then things are processed through hidden layers, perhaps recurrent layers, and eventually you're going to have some sort of output. And that might be a translate to classify, uh, to uh, output a model, or perhaps to um, tell an actuator to take a motion. And so, there is a uh, uh, essentially um, a map then from these uh, from these vectors back to discrete entities, which can be thought of as our symbols. Uh, in the simplest case, this mapping is uh, is is simply a um, 
uh, you know, a, a, a set of um, units that, uh, of, of, of uh, soft max units, uh, but you might also do something like take the uh, output and look for the nearest neighbor in your space, in your dictionary of your dense embeddings and use that. So something a little more complicated than just a soft max. And I said, that's, that's really uh, uh, been, I said, surprisingly successful in, in many applications. And I said, some people believe that's, that's all there is uh, to it. And, uh, and that the, all the, interest, the interesting work is really going to be uh, understanding that architecture between that's all inside this neural net. Uh, second category of, of, of approaches, I would I have symbolic square brackets neuro uh, to indicate that a, a neural system is embedded as a subroutine within an essentially an, a symbolic reasoning system. And uh, of course, the, if you look at game playing systems such as AlphaGo or even the much more impressive AlphaZero, both real tour de forces, um, what they are is you have a Monte Carlo game tree search algorithm with a neural net state estimator as a, essentially as a subroutine. And you could pull out that neural net state estimator and have some other kind of state estimator it, it probably won't do as well, uh, but that even though it's a, a randomized algorithm, that that Monte Carlo game tree search is essentially uh, you know good old uh, uh, symbolic AI dealing with sort of discrete uh, uh, a search through a discrete uh, state space. For uh, self-driving cars, uh, most of these are, again, fall in this uh, general idea of, of a symbolic system that calls on uh, neural uh, subsystems for uh, particular um, capabilities uh, such as object recognition. Okay, so uh, here you would have your, your vision coming in and a deep learning system uh, is, is turning that into essentially into symbols, into saying, I think the person is on the, this location on the map with this uh, radius of possible error. Um, and then applying, uh, for example, a good old fashioned A star uh, root planning uh, on, 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 tap, on top of that. Um, there have been, as is I'm sure again you're aware, uh, people who have built end-to-end -end, uh, deep learning systems where you literally have just the camera with the inputs going all the way to the actuator, so that that standard operating procedure module, and the middle is a complete uh, black box. Um, in fact, that was done many decades ago. I remember at at, a, at an Hkai in the 70s, actually seeing a, a car driving around in a, a circle that was being demonstrated, uh, just that. Um, but they certainly have not reached the level of sophistication uh, uh, that we need for a, a, a truly robust self-driving car, the more like line following programs. Okay, so another approach um, I'd call neuro, uh, uh, semicolon symbolic, which is a cascade from a neural network into a symbolic reasoner. So um, this is uh, some recent work out of Josh Tenenbaum's group at, at MIT. And uh, the idea here is you have uh, visual representations that are, that are coming in. So these are, are again, uh, are bitmaps um, uh, that are, uh, are going to, you'll need to be interpreted. And from the bits you get to things like um, concept embeddings, like, like sphere, like a sphere or a block or uh, the color green, right? Which are again, are all these uh, vector uh, uh, type uh, concepts. Uh, you have language coming in, um, uh, uh, query language, and that could be a, a neural process, although in this particular example, um, it, we're using a symbolic uh, parser. 
And then everything gets fed into a symbolic reasoner to return an answer, like what is the shape of the red object left to the sphere? Now, what happens when the system makes a mistake is, is kind of what makes this a truly neuro-symbolic system is they uh, describe algorithms for basically back propagating um, all the way through the symbolic reasoning system uh, uh, through the parser to um, uh, improve the, um, the likelihood of the proper parse from that parser and uh, through the, the uh, symbolic and through the system that recognizes that turns those those bits into symbols of the image. So I, I'm not sure if semicolon was the, um, the the right symbol to use for that cascade, but I, I wanted to reserve the arrow for uh, a different uh, use here. I call it neuro colon symbolic to neuro. And here I'm using the notation in the way it is, is used in, the, in math to describe a function that maps from one domain to the other. So the idea in this approach is you're actually going to um, have a training process that compiles away symbolic rules all the way into this mysterious uh, neural structure. So, if you have a symbolic rule like A uh, becomes B, turn that into an input output training pair, A comma B, where A is the input, B is the label or the output. And you um, do that for a lot of rules and you get a system that surprisingly enough uh, can actually take an original input A and produce an original output B according to those rules. And this is the work on deep learning for symbolic mathematics, where they, um, the idea is that you want to simplify a mathematical expression. So there's a, a possible input, the integral of x to the n dx, and the output of, you know, of that, the, the symbolic form is one over n plus one to times x to the n plus one. It, it's, it seems almost like magic that this, this works. Um, is, it, is it simply memorizing? Is it actually gaining an understanding of mathematics? There, there is evidence that it's doing more than memorizing. Uh, uh, but I said, there, there, I said, as you see, it's just a paper from last year. Uh, similar work is, is being tried all over and it's been, I, I think it's remarkable. Uh, uh, it does involve though lots of training and working in, so far it's been in domains like math where you have very clean, uh, uh, these, these kinds of derivation of rules. There simply are sound transformations. And the output is still not sort of, uh, it's a, a good guess. So it still has to be verified. Although in, in the experiments, it's like 95% of the time a correct guess. There's again, a, a different approach to this idea of, of, uh, of compiling where you're not using input output pairs. Um, I call it uh, neuro a subscript symbolic to indicate that you're going to take your symbolic rules and use them as templates for structures within the neural network. And so this is work that uh, was uh, mostly done in the, around 2016, 2017. It's a little bit under the radar right now uh, called tensor product representations or logic tensor uh, networks. Um, and the, the, the idea is sort of to encourage uh, the, the network to learn something that is consistent with the logical representation. Um, if, if I were to sort of add another category, there's one similar to this. Again, I call it the, a different kind of neuro uh, subscript symbolic, where instead of pushing the symbolic part into the structure of the neural network, um, you push the symbolic part as into a regular 
regularization term, which you apply uh, to the, 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 the deep learning um, objective function. Uh, so this has been used for abstraction part of whole uh, hierarchies, not really though for like, combinatorial reasoning by cases. Um, uh, would, would one of the hosts tell me how many more minutes I have? Because we started a little bit late, so I don't want to run over time. So I can either speed up or take my time. Uh, how about uh, maybe five to 10 minutes at most? Okay, great. I won't, I won't take any longer. This is my, this is my last example. Of the, of the taxonomy, so. And so here's one that, that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing, uh, which is, I, I call it a neuro braces symbolic, the idea of embedding symbolic reasoning inside of a neural engine. And um, I don't think it's a particularly original idea. I, it seems like the most straightforward way of, of, of you might go about actually implementing uh, the idea of, um, of type one and type two reasoning or thinking fast and slow as described in, in the books by uh, Daniel Canahan and his collaborators. The idea that, that people really have two different reasoning systems. We have uh, most of the time, we have uh, uh, our type one reasoning, which is very fast, uh, kind of uh, reactive, uh, approximate, based largely on similarity. So some of things that sound very much like artificial neural networks, but then occasionally, uh, rarely, sometimes not for days, but once in a while, we need to do deliberative type two reasoning, uh, going through things case by case. So it's, it's kind of rare in ordinary life, but it's very common in business AI. And uh, the psychological results all show that People are, or the type one is subject to very systematic uh, biases because things are being done on the basis of similarity rather than true uh, sort of probabilistic reasoning. And that people tend to be uh, uh, pretty bad at type two reasoning, but they, they can learn. It's just, it's like kind of painful. Um, so I was thinking about that. And then on another book, um, I read that I, I found really interesting is uh, this book on rethinking consciousness by um, uh, a, a respected neuroscientist um, who is trying to come up with a theory of what it meant to be aware of, of having some sub subjective experience. And he talks in this book about something called the attention schema which is the, the, the brain's um, model of itself. And, and in particular, it's model of what it is attending to. So it's like when you are actually consciously aware that you are listening to my voice or looking at these slides. So you have um, a, an internal model of the system state of attention, but it's, so it's not the system's attention mechanism, it's a model of that attention mechanism. And what I thought might be a, um, a way of putting these ideas together is that when attention to concepts is very high and, and you're sort of facing this uh, a hard decision problem, um, they, they become uh, symbolic entities in an attention schema. So the attention schema is sort of a uh, is now you've taken that that those vector representations and sort of forced them down to a, a a particular most likely interpretation in this intention schema. And once they're in the attention schema, you can do this conscious, uh, self-aware uh, reasoning with them. So the idea that the appearance of a goal in the attention schema. Uh, could signal that deliberative symbolic reasoning should be initiated. I'm not just perceiving or remembering, I'm consciously thinking. And now the, what's, what's great about machines is that they're pretty good at combinatorial reasoning, you know, up to, you know, thousands of entities, uh, uh, many, you know, many, uh, you know, millions or even billions of states, possible combinations where people 
sort of max out at a few dozen a possible combination. So the idea is that you could really create, use this to create a sort of super superhuman reasoning system source there are neural systems that can perform superhuman type two reasoning because they could apply they could appeal to an efficient combinatorial reasoning system so this is a little toy here's our mouse looking at the cheese and uh, really thinking about how do i get there and so that becomes then instantiated uh symbolically in the um attention schema and there's a goal of getting to the cheese and now a symbolic reasoning engine that that can reason about shortest paths and and how graphs work uh, could produce the uh, a path and then a representation of the solution perhaps that actual image of, of the path overlaid upon the visual representation of the um, of the maze is, is fed back into the neural network in, by the encoder. And now the neural network can basically follow the red line to the cheese. And um, there's been a somewhat, some similar ideas. There's a, a, uh, some work a, a few years ago uh, by Bengio and Sholkoff on reduced vector representations that, that say, well, uh, that instead of going all the way to a symbolic representation might just go to a sparser um, a vector representation. Um, but if you go all the way to a symbolic representation, then you can really take advantage of symbolic reasoning algorithms of, of that, can, so that are good for combinatorial search until they hit the knee in, in that uh, explosion. So, um, you know, so things like this is an example of a, of a, of a problem that Martin Huell worked on, um, uh, a, a, a mathematical uh, problem with, with Latin squares that took up you know, 200 terabytes. Um, you might also say, well, but don't you have a problem? How do you learn since that symbolic reasoning system uh, is, uh, that might not support um, differentiation and backpropagation? Well, you said you probably don't want to differentiate through all trillion inference steps it performs, but there also are, are, are non-gradient-based um, uh, ways of, 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 of optimizing. Uh, another is that, well, the scheme doesn't handle non-logical reasoning. I suspect it can be extended to sound probabilistic reasoning, Bayesian type, Bayesian net type reasoning, but not similarity reasoning, because that's really what that neural net is good for. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll uh, conclude with, um, I really think the next step of AI will be some kind of neuro symbolic framework. Many different approaches are being explored. And I said, I, I, I don't know which is gonna be the winner. I said, I, ha I have some ones that I like to see explored, but uh, it might be the, the standard operating procedure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry, very much for that insightful talk and also the categorization of various uh, combinations of uh, neural and symbolic uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, there, uh, there, uh, Ravi Sharma has a few questions on the chat, but before that, uh, one thing we, we are interested in this uh, group is uh, uh, how can this combination be used to actually generate symbol structures or ontologies? Uh, can uh, you had so you have you had yeah. so you had that in one of your slides kind of thing yes yes yeah it, it, exactly yes so so um well uh you know i actually that that's a great question i, I hadn't thought much about it i've been thinking about well from the symbolic representations leaping directly to um uh just the the task of of, of logical inference or problem solving but right, there's also the, the idea that from those uh, those symbols, uh, turning them into an ontology mm -hmm. um, as uh, that to 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 leverage the um, uh, the fact that you have you have kind of a hierarchical representation, although it's kind of 
not always clear what what those steps are. Is, are they you know are they part whole? Um, uh, uh, are they you know you know part part or 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 um, uh, or, or, or or kind more abstract kind uh, uh, hierarchies? Um, rather than babble on any longer, I think we're going to probably be hearing about uh, more ideas about that. Uh, from the the next speaker, so I'll I'll uh, with that I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll take a pass and try to think about that more. Yeah, uh, thank you, Henry and uh, Ravi. It's a quick question because before we pass on, because you have a number of questions on the chat because where you have uh, oh, okay yeah yeah even sure. difference between mindfulness and conscious thinking. <laughs> so there's a chat page. I don't know whether you, whether you oh there there's it. the chat. Okay. Um, uh, for some so the reason, chat pages in the link that we sent you, there's a chat. Yes. Oh, oh, it's a separate link. Okay. It's a separate link. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, if, if if you could if you could pick out uh, questions from the chat to provide to me, that would be great. So, because okay. I don't have that. I have, now, so. I have two questions, essentially. One is the relevance of tensors, um, which apply to multi-dimensional spaces. What relationship do these tensors have? with the uh, uh, neural network as such, because we do relate tensors to quantum states and general relativity, for example. Yeah, um, I'm not actually aware of, of any specific um, uh, uh, deep connection between the use of, of, of tensors in, in quantum mechanics, uh, which you think of, you know, our, our Basically, often you apply different kinds of, of sort of fixed operators to tensors, and the use of, of tensors as they are used in neural networks, which you really are just talking about matrices and ordinary matrix operations. So, unless somebody uh, can correct me, I, I think it's a uh, it's a potentially misleading similarity. They both are using. They both are using a sort of generalized matrices, but that I, I don't think, I think that's where the connection ends. Okay. And as Ram mentioned, what's the difference between mindfulness and conscious thinking in the light uh, of a attention schema or otherwise? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, so in some ways, I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on mindfulness. I, my impression, you know, just from, from sort of, you know, popular uh, reading is, is that, that uh, mindfulness is, is a lot about getting uh, your conscious, uh, getting away from an over uh, focus on the interaction between your 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 mind and your models, and 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 stop thinking about thinking, and, and sort of breaking out of that, mm -hmm. um, that, and uh, 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 more doing more to sort of to attend to sort of what is actually happening, not always and not and not sort of projecting into the past into the future, right? So so I, I think that they are. Um, they actually are, are, are kind of opposing <laughs> concepts. Uh, is they're, they're like like different points on, on, on the extreme, and I would I would say that probably um, uh, traditional neural net systems are highly mindful, uh, but not conscious. And 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 I'm sort of uh, I think the attention scheme of the idea is trying to uh, bring in consciousness, but there is this this danger of consciousness of becoming uh, disengaged from what's actually happening because you're just sort of so focused on your internal model of what's happening. Yeah, I think uh, Henry, that's a good uh, answer to that question because uh, in terms of uh, mindfulness uh, is more of uh, getting away from the, from, from the reality in some sense and going into a different space where you cut off from, the, from, from current uh, focusing on certain Stress, stress items. So mindfulness will relieve that, release that stress. Whereas if you go to the attention uh, issues that you're talking about, you're more concentrating on a certain aspect of the thing. So you do more symbolic kind of structures are needed in there. 
So that's an excellent response. Thank you. Uh, and uh, let me see. Yeah, we are at, uh, unless there is uh, uh, a pressing question, we can come back to that later. I know, Henry, your time schedule, but uh, we'll let uh, uh, Amit take over now. Uh, then, as Henry said, that uh, this is a nice segue into Amit's talk in terms of can knowledge graphs help make deep learning systems more interpretable and explainable. So I will uh, ask Amit to take over. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm very lucky I'm following uh, the um, talk by Henry. I think it gave, uh, it, I think what I have to say uh, fits in right, um, uh, you know, just follows what I think uh, the broad um, canvas that he painted. Um, Hopefully, I can get uh, to one level deeper and uh, get onto a little bit of specifics. And also, hopefully, I bring a perspective uh, uh, from more practical things that are happening um, uh, along the significant use of knowledge graphs these days, uh, significant development and use of knowledge graphs and uh, the actual opportunities for developing concrete solutions. Uh, so, um, you know, it's about knowledge graphs and uh, making deep learning systems more interpretable and explainable. And uh, I have a longer talk, but uh, for the time we have, I will be focusing more on uh, natural language uh, processing and especially understanding. Uh, the similar example can be found in automated vehicles and variety of in sensor data and other uh, cases also. So, um, around in the general area, we, we call a knowledge infused learning. Um, there are a whole number of people working with me and just I wanted to acknowledge them. Um, uh, some of the collaborations in, uh, you know, go beyond just uh, our institute, AI Institute at South Carolina. Uh, and uh, I just say the kind of kind of things we do at uh, the AI Institute in the middle, you see um, uh, core AI problems, and we do a lot of translational research. So on the outside, you see uh, actual collaborations ongoing right now across the campus and, and nation. Um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, you can find more discussion on that in this paper that just came out, or article rather, uh, with the same title, uh, more or less as uh, this this talk. Uh, so wanted to um, you know say that there is something more descriptive about what I'm going to say today. Um, and um, in uh, longer talk, I talk about the knowledge graph and ontologies. Uh, I won't hear because uh, this audience is uh, very much up to date on uh, those issues, and I could use the time for some other things. So, uh, in, for for me, the intuition behind uh, why deep learning needs knowledge uh, is that uh, you really, uh, when you want to endow intelligence to machine is just simply not possible in my view without the knowledge and experience plus reasoning. So um, while we are focused in the third wave that um, uh, uh, that Henry talked about um, on the uh, on learning uh, from data on the statistical learning, uh, there is just so much um, uh, that there is very concrete need for um, uh, the knowledge and uh, experience and reasoning. Uh, to essentially um, uh, make uh, a system, uh, broadly speaking, intelligent, or something that understands and makes uh, um, decisions based on true understanding of the content rather than some uh, pattern or signature or so, so forth. And I see in my mind, um, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, 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 I get uh, inspiration from uh, co uh, cognitive science. Uh, they talk about top brain and bottom brain. Uh, from uh, behavioral um, economics, uh, uh, Henry pointed out, uh, Daniel Kahneman and others work on the system one and system two, uh, and perception and cognition. Uh, I see that kind of uh, duality there. And, um, and that uh, the integration of that thing and something that makes this transition possible in our brain, I think we do perception uh, and we also do, you know, uh, deliberative decision making and reasoning. One that really glues the things together, one that connects the two uh, in a more deliberative fashion is that knowledge. So I see a huge uh, uh, value, need and requirement for uh, uh, infusing knowledge in this computational process. That kind of is what drives a bit of good bit of work that we are doing. 
uh, it just so happened that uh, we uh, have this article coming out in the uh, 75 year celebration issue for the IEEE. And, uh, you know, uh, Henry talked about three waves. So we talked about duality of data and knowledge across the uh, three waves of data. Um, and there is an archive version of that. But essentially, you know, we look at layered hybrid systems using neural networks and deep learning for perception with knowledge based reasoning system for decision making. And you start with the, you know, so you, you see this kind of uh, uh, here a hierarchy of uh, going away from low level to deliberate decisions and actions. And you really, uh, I, I, I see the role of knowledge to be very fundamental. Uh, when, um, uh, even when you have very large amount of, let's say, clinical data, uh, let's say uh, uh, medical imaging, the reason that um, a clinician would not use the system is because you cannot explain how did you come to that uh, decision and that uh, what would be necessary is for the system to be aware of the medical knowledge that is used in the medical guideline that the doctor is, is implementing and has to implement. And so one way or another that has to be brought into the system before, uh, you know, this uh, very powerful system uh, would be useful uh, for uh, decision making. Um, um, and um, there are many reasons in particular going one level deeper why knowledge graphs um, um, are very important. Let's say, as I said, I, I kind of focus on uh, NLP, NLU. Uh, and uh, in the talk, again, there are many reasons, but I will just focus on better contextualization of words and how much context is ne needed to provide a precise uh, response. That general area is what I will focus on, uh, even though a lot more uh, things has to be addressed and work is being done on all of that. So this thing is exciting to me here um, in that, um, in this case, with the use case of natural language understanding, I see that you know, these days we are, we are all aware of very, very powerful, quote unquote, powerful uh, language models. And, and, and some people have rather uh, unreasonable um, expectation from these language models. And then uh, you are seeing a lot of uh, discussions on the, their limitations. Um, the way I see is that really, uh, if you want to make these systems more useful, uh, you really have to use a whole layer of knowledge. So when we talk about knowledge infusion, it's just not something, one concrete you know, type of knowledge. There is really multiple types of knowledge you really have to think about. So here I portrayed a, a plausible um, you know, variety of knowledge uh, that would be necessary for uh, deeper understanding of language uh, of text. Um, and it will start with the uh, language syntactic structure and grammar and some dependency graph tagging and uh, you know POS and dependency graph and complex entity identification to linguistic knowledge uh, like WordNet to common sense knowledge like ConceptNet to uh, broad and general purpose knowledge that uh, uh, we have or we can have access to uh, and to uh, domain specific knowledge and the important thing also to notice is that uh, there won't be necessarily only one uh, type of knowledge source at any one layer. For example, at the broad or general purpose knowledge level, in addition to getting something from Wikipedia or DBpedia or Wikidata, I would very much want, in some applications, I may want something like OpenStreetMap and have location related uh, knowledge. Uh, so there can be actually multiple uh, knowledge uh, representatives in an in a implementation context. Uh, at each level. Similarly, many domain specific uh, knowledge base will be necessary in certain clinical applications. Uh, but this is doable. Uh, and that this is the kind of system that we are building now. I'm going to give you one kind of example. We start with this little paragraph um, in the news uh, article uh, about uh, CDC adding the test for coronavirus. On the left hand side, you see, um, you know, a, um, let's see if I, uh, there is the so uh, you you see here uh, the um, uh, uh, neural parsing with self attention and you are able to find a variety of uh, concepts here on the right hand side you see use of um, um, uh, you know uh, 
additional use of domain specific knowledge and uh, snowman city and snowman city hierarchy for entities and you'll be able to identify a number of other things in particular it's possible that dbpedia is not yet up to date with uh, coronavirus and uh, we will find uh, that actually already added to snowman city and that that itself would also help in getting understanding of some of the concepts but as you can see here different type of knowledge uh, can lead to different type of so these are the things that you got with dbpedia and these are the things you got initially with um, Stomer City. And hence, uh, you are in each of them are adding uh, in a different ways to understanding different aspects of the language. Okay. Um, I probably need to, I don't know what is happening with the uh, annotation. Uh, hopefully, this will help. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so uh, there are many shortcomings of deep learning. Uh, there are many articles on this, um, uh, and this particularly the black boxness where uh, you're not able to interpret and explain um, uh, has many aspects, components, and reasons for that. Again, uh, there are uh, three uh, items that I hope to uh, talk about a little bit more in in this in this uh, talk. Oops. Um, so this annotation, I know, made it work out very well. Um, we'll, we'll deal with, let's see. I should have practiced the annotation part. What's happening? I mean, oh, it, it, these annotations are not going away, but I found okay. it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so um, now when you uh, apply statistical uh, learning, what happens is that you may get um, um, uh, you know, uh, these kind of clusters on the left-hand side. But um, what you see is on the right-hand side, um, uh, relationships are at the heart of semantics that are very critical and that uh, you can get a much better level of understanding um, by adding the relationships. So what you see on the right-hand side is that uh, you can enhance what you are getting uh, through this clustering of, let's say, morphine cluster to all the things inside it by applying the subtle knowledge that is already there in the knowledge graph. And that can also add to the in, uh, interpretability uh, directly. Um, okay. Now, the, uh, the other interesting thing is that there are a lot of uh, biases, um, uh, you know, uh, for these black box approaches. Um, some of them, for example, historical bias that so few percent of the CEOs have been women that um, you may get an idea that the CEO must be a man or uh, in the image net only, um, you know, one person of the images come from China. Again, you'll get a lot of bias and so on and so forth. This is something we understand very well. Well, uh, I think the knowledge graphs can be a very important uh, uh, way to uh, identify these biases and to complement the limitations thereof. So let's look at a, a relatively trivial case of question answering. Uh, you know, uh, here is a, you know, the context is I sometimes wonder how many alcoholics are relapsing under lockdown. And then is a question, does the person have a uh, addiction, a sequence to sequence model, um, you know, would uh, say yes, because that there is overwhelming um, um, evidence it has in terms of uh, co-occurrences uh, that it would think that um, that is the case. But um, if you look at now this uh, sentence, um, uh, and you ask the question, does the person suffer from depression? Uh, the answer you'll get uh, without knowledge uh, would be, you know, would be yes. Two answer is no. There is both a negation and a knowledge that manic episode is a characteristic of anxiety and not depression. So the deeper understanding that is of beyond syntax uh, involving mental health domain is what is necessary if you're going to answer this question well. There's, uh, you know, something we, um, you know, all, everybody I think in this audience understands the uh, reasoning and multi hop reasoning. Again, these are the kind of things that are uh, nearly impossible uh, to do uh, without the use of explicit knowledge 
uh, symbolic representation and reasoning that goes with it. Uh, so um, um, there has been many, um, you know, uh, 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 illustrious uh, success stories. Alpha Poll Two is one of them from last year. But what you see is that it actually uses knowledge from protein data bank to explore and exploit the search space in the protein folding. So again, you'll see that knowledge is actually getting very much uh, uh, added to the uh, you know uh, deep learning algorithms. The point here is though uh, to investigate strategies of doing th that in a lot more flexible way. So. Uh, here it was solving a very specific problem and the uh, data necessary was uh, very much available from the source of protein data bank and other things that they were able to do. In general though, uh, the knowledge that we need to infuse is more, more, more desperate, more come, comes from more diverse sources and uh, somehow we need to bring all of that, get, get that, to get the, that together and then apply that. So uh, there's still additional step and knowledge infusion can help with those like, why is this the best structure for a particular purpose? We want to explain that. Uh, it will give you variety of uh, protein folding uh, structures, but why is that the case? Um, does the structure meet desired functional properties? Uh, another use case we are looking at recently was drug design. And uh, in the drug design, uh, there are a lot of generative models that can help you find all kinds of um, a plausible uh, molecular structure molecules, but um, in a good uh, in any drug design, you have to work up, think about solubility and um, uh, toxicity profile uh, uh, panels as studies. And the ideal thing would be for us to be able to infuse knowledge to be able to do those toxicity and um, uh, you know uh, solubility related studies as part of the learning process that uh, you know from the data to the decisions. So um, symbolic knowledge glued with statistical knowledge or infusing, uh, you know, uh, is what we, uh, in one particular, one strategy that we, the strategy that we follow is this knowledge infused learning. And um, basically knowledge graphs here for us provide scaffolding, scaffolding to punctuate neural computing. Uh, it, it allows, uh, you know, imagine that there is a, uh, you know, a trellis and then you are uh, training your wine on the trellis, you are able to structure what's going on, which is highly um, uh, opaque to something that is a lot more meaningful. And you take them through the path that you understand, and then you can interpret the better, interpret it better and explain it better. So again, um, that analogy uh, is in the bottom I mentioned. Um, we have uh, in one of the articles we have outlined uh, a broad variety of um, strategies and and and, uh, and and reviewed what is uh, there in the literature uh, and we are kind of broadly identify that is a shallow infusion strategies uh, semi deep infusion strategies and deep infusion strategies um, and uh, basically the um, uh, shallow infusion is about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, adding uh, the self-aware uh, or uh, knowledge, external knowledge to the input. So you can see here on the left hand side you are adding that, and typically it is about like creating knowledge graph embedding. That's a reasonably well understood thing. In the uh, semi-deep infusion we talk about, we are actually changing or at, 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 you know the uh, the parameters. Right, and uh, and here we are doing it at one layer in the deep learning mechanism. And in the uh, and here is the here is how um, it kind of looks like. So uh, what happens is that um, you're seeing this text here, and then you're seeing the annotations and see them map to the knowledge graph. Right, and that is the one uh, that would um, uh, uh, provide us the additional capabilities that comes from knowledge infused learning, all those things that we are talking about in interpretability, explainability and, and, and things. So you see here on the, there is this little map on the left hand side in the bottom, there's a DSM-5 knowledge graph. And then there is a uh, matrix uh, that is created. Um, 
uh, using Ceno, and that is then what is um, integrated uh, or, 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 or uh, with the um, uh, similar metrics that would otherwise be generated in the um, deep learning model. So the so that the parameters are uh, modified uh, because these uh, particular metrics uh, uh, you know brings in the uh, uh, information from this knowledge, and that is what then leads us to uh, you know uh, the additional power that comes from knowledge. So this then becomes um, you know um, more interpretable and uh, and and also explainable. In the uh, real, in, in the deep learning, deep infusion method, we are talking about, we are looking into uh, stratified knowledge. Uh, because uh, you are, earlier, you uh, remember I showed you a whole set of layer of uh, knowledge, different types of knowledge. Whether it is that kind of layer of knowledge or the knowledge of uh, abstraction. One of the, uh, you know, area that I'm deeply interested in is um, this trifecta of, um, Contextualization, personalization, and abstraction. And there was recently a, uh, you know, uh, I think archive paper by uh, Mitchell uh, on 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 abstraction. And uh, this is something that humans do very very well. And uh, one one way at a very high level, you can say when you go from system one to system two, is that you are transcending the levels of abstraction and you go into the higher level of abstraction. We need to endow uh, the deep learning uh, techniques uh, strategies with uh, this uh, whole idea of abstraction. And for that, we are seeing this specified knowledge as a, way, uh, um, as a uh, vehicle. And then you are, uh, we are looking into uh, integrating knowledge at different layers. Uh, but um, the challenge is, uh, you know, that there are, of course, technical challenges and the challenges are really finding um, uh, not only being able to uh, you know attenuate or modify the uh, the layers but uh, find the knowledge that uh, uh, at the level of abstraction that um, really fits the uh, kind of uh, processing that is done at that particular layer of the deep learning right so I, you you get a sense that basically what you are looking at is that here's a layer of uh, you know uh, in deep learning, and here is the stratified representation of knowledge. <coughs> and at least every layer, knowledge is used to um, modify uh, the computation. So that can lead to, in my view, very, very powerful <coughs> strategy. And I really want to go towards supporting abstraction in, the, uh, uh, in, in this knowledge infused learning framework. In the uh, shallow infusion, uh, you want to be able to uh, <coughs> um, explain, and uh, I think I'm going to pass that uh, thing. So, what you can do is when you are able to identify flu, uh, pneumonia, COVID, <coughs> you can essentially come to an understanding through external knowledge that these are there is a concept of affected population and communicable diseases and just as uh, <clears throat> flu and pneumonia can kill people covid-19 also kill people kill people and then there is additional information that six times more so um, Having the uh, method of having the uh, this knowledge uh, now in this particular case in the shell infusion, the knowledge is coming in by crea you know creating a vector to match the um, uh, the knowledge embedding space to the uh, data embedding, and in that case you your your <coughs> depth of understanding is still limited, very limited. I'm going to take an example of healthcare. Here are the definition, excuse me, uh, um, <clears throat> for a bit of allergies here. That an interpretive system provides an ability to discern the internal mechanism of any module. Explanation, explanation system would comprise of collectively uh, <coughs> exhaustive interpretive subsystems and orchestration among them. When applied to deep learning, text would typically be, you know, you'll be able to explain the decision-making process. 
<coughs> domain knowledge in explainability uh, you know it's uh, as you think about it would would play a very significant and very vast knowledge don't have time to think about uh, sorry, talk about all of these uh, stuff but uh, all of these abilities that knowledge adds <coughs> but all of these um, uh, you know you can argue basically as you think deeply that infusing the knowledge into the learning process uh, will enable you to have all of the capabilities that I've listed. Uh, that's from the source that is by the way identified there. Let's look at this um, complex, uh, uh, you know, this statement, uh, uh, you know, from a from a Reddit post or something like that. And um, if the model, uh, you know, you, you ask, is this uh, mental health related and which mental health condition? Well, um, uh, it will predict depression. That would be wrong. And um, uh, the true answer in this particular case is OCD. And why it is depression, it won't be able to explain. Here, through the infusion strategy, uh, you can make it interpretable, but because you can say what aspect of this learning process contributes to coming up with uh, the solution, uh, the correct solution of OCD. Better yet, uh, you are able to connect uh, the, the text uh, and the concepts in the text, entities and concepts in the text to the concept in the ontology or knowledge graph. And then what I can, uh, you can see, you, you, uh, you can replace those with those concepts, uh, the, the text with the concepts. So here you can see that there was a concept related to obsess uh, obsessive compulsive uh, personality disorder. And then there is a disturbance in thinking. Having now that um, information you, and the knowledge graph that says that um, disturbance in thinking uh, uh, he, he, he is, uh, you know, related to OCD and some other aspects that I'm not going to will lead you to explain why this is obsessive compulsive disorder. There are um, uh, similar statements for similar example from education use case uh, is something uh, we work with a large uh, edutech company. And uh, uh, here, uh, you know, the use case is uh, about explaining why a student is not able to answer on a particular test. That there is, um, uh, you know, for, for projectile motion, you need to understand different equation. For that, you need a quadratic equation understanding. Uh, uh, and, and, and that kind of um, knowledge is necessary to be able to understand the action that a student makes in terms of decision making. So, and there are, while we talk about knowledge infused learning, uh, there are a whole bunch of related areas. There is a term used called information learning uh, and, and, um, and many other uh, things you can see here where uh, you'll find the concepts related to the kind of things I talked about today. Um, with the, uh, there are a lot of possible uh, uh, use cases or areas that we uh, can make impact in. Uh, we work off, especially here in, we are working on virtual health assistance quite a bit in our institute, and we are also working on self-driving uh, car, cars. Uh, so, uh, um, and, and, and in the, uh, in the just other areas that I've listed here, um, so there's a huge um, area of um, impact for this class of work. What we are essentially doing is that Compared to earlier effort on human labeling effort and um, feature engineering effort uh, from top right corner to bottom left corner, we are making steady progress by using, um, you know, by, by using knowledge uh, and combining that with symbolic, pro, uh, with, 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 the, with the statistical AI uh, to get this um, knowledge um, enhanced neurosymbolic computing or um, uh, or, um, or knowledge infused learning, as you call it. There's a, a bunch of paper, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, that, that are good examples of the kind of things I talked about that can be explained in the future. 
well uh, so i think i manage my time very well um, and um, uh, hopefully there will be questions that we can talk about as usual uh, thanks to nsf and nih for a long uh, series of funding okay thank you amit uh, that was an excellent follow up for the talk which uh, henry gave and uh, you delved on some of the things that uh, henry also mentioned in his uh, talk uh, it looks like uh, the kind of uh, things you have uh, you you are you are using kind of neural networks in a way to generate the symbols there and then you put that in the knowledge graph and then there's a lot of feedback it's kind of very complicated in some sense because you you also have iteration uh, do you do that like get back to the neural networks again based on what you have learned in the knowledge graphs well i mean if you want to do interpretation uh, then uh, you want to be able to explain where in that uh, neural net processing um, uh, you know uh, there is a supporting evidence for the answer so in that sense uh, you are doing that uh, you can in inspect the parts of the uh, processing pipeline uh, or processing that uh, essentially provides a support for the answer that came uh that would be only partial thing the interpretability because interpretability is not explainability and for explanation you i gave you a one uh, you know a concrete example where i uh, replace in the text by the concepts in the knowledge graph and the knowledge graph uh, you are able to reason that in ocd case there are these uh, other things and hence it is not a depression but it is ocd so this kind of um, you know uh, part requires um, i think a, a combination of things coming from both um, you know you know statistical processing and um, uh, symbolic processing and so the you, together is what gets gives us the power uh, you know, that that, uh, amit can you give some metrics in terms of how big are these knowledge graphs neural networks and so on like what what does it mean for someone who's trying to implement this uh, what what did, what should they be ready for and what are, this? so so what are they ready for let me see uh, here um, so first of all uh, as you uh, as we all know um, and i didn't talk about uh, the knowledge graphs today uh, hopefully this, so so um, just to quickly see there are um, you know many many uh, stories on knowledge graph this is my use of knowledge graph in the patent uh, which was the first knowledge graph uh, or, or ontology based uh, semantic search um, uh, 12 13 years before google uh, came out with its uh, um, um, you know, big semantic search. Uh, and there are so many knowledge graphs here. This is just a, a sort of partial list of knowledge graph. Here are the general purpose knowledge graph. Here are the health specific knowledge graphs. For example, uh, you know, we have built a, uh, an ontology called drug abuse ontology. Um, uh, and um, uh, that is a deep understanding uh, of uh, all the concepts involved in uh, addiction. And uh, those kind of, uh, uh, there are, of course, um, you know, enterprises are using knowledge graph. So all of these companies that are listed, they have their own knowledge graphs. Uh, I showed you this uh, educational company. They have built a very, very large, uh, the largest knowledge graph um, in the um, uh, education space. And there's another company I co-founded called EasyDI. Uh, you can see the, you know, large knowledge graph they have built on, on that side. Okay, this is the knowledge graph for education company so basically what we have is knowledge graphs of all different kinds and variety and what you are trying to do is uh, this broad model that i uh, outline here uh, this this these are the uh, you know uh, templates in a way the models of how um, we are taking the knowledge and uh, adding that to the um, 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 uh, you know and, and other people had also recognized this potential. So um, 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 there are a number of people who have created a knowledge graph uh, uh, based embedding or knowledge graph embeddings. And you essentially, uh, uh, so now you reduce your knowledge graph to a vector space, and then you are basically combining that with the uh, vectors that are there in the deep learning algorithm anyway. In any, any particular sequence to sequence model, you'll have a uh, you know, data uh, vector space you create from data. And you're basically uh, you know, combining the two. So that is the simplest form that people did. The problem with that simplest form is that now, yes, you are able to atten attenuate or, or modify certain dates in the um, uh, vector that you create from data by incorporating what is learned from knowledge in the 
limited form of knowledge graph embedding. What you don't have are richness of knowledge graph. You don't have the relationship retained, for example. So um, um, uh, you, it is important uh, in this other strategies allow you to go back to in the uh, in this example uh, that I gave if in this uh, particular slide. You see what is happening here is that we know that uh, this concept here maps to this uh, node in the knowledge graph. So for example, uh, we are uh, one of our use cases understand is radicalization in social media. And there uh, we wanted to understand the radicalization process through the eye of an empirical model that a political scientist developed. Uh, and his empirical model was that there are three factors in radicalization in social media, the uh, religion, the ideology and hate or violence. So we wanted to look, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the uh, text from all of the, the lens of religion, uh, while, uh, uh, you know, ideology and the hate and uh, violence. So for religion, for example, we created a knowledge graph from uh, Hadith. Uh, so we, we, we can study this for Islamic terrorism. We can study this for um, white, extremism, white extremism. And uh, we created in the case of Islamic um, radicalization knowledge graph from Hadith and um, uh, Quran, which are the religious texts. And there, um, there are two different, if you do look at the knowledge graph, you'll find that there are two nodes for uh, jihad. This is jihad, the, as is using Quran for peaceful purpose, for a positive purpose, and a jihad that is used by extremists for, um, you know, uh, uh, negative purpose. So when we do the mapping here, you see this jihad, the jihad, there are three, uh, there are multiple jihad in this text. But they are being mapped to different nodes. This one jihad is mapped to this node here, and these two jihad are mapped to this node. So this is contextually understanding. You see that the top two jihad. Uh, uh, let me portray the slide here. Uh, you can see it more easily. See the top two jihad here. They map here. This is the negative use of jihad. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is the uh, positive use, of, and then there is a negative use of jihad. This is, you know, uh, uh, killing and other things like that. So, um, um, uh, so, 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 uh, sorry, there, there can be two different one. I don't know. Maybe this picture doesn't show you that. But the two jihad will have different nodes uh, based on the different use of jihad, and then you are able to explain that jihad is used in different ways in different, um, uh, you know, in different texts. And now you can explain, well, you know, this is a wrong use of jihad, and is used for radicalization while this is other positive use jihad that is not used for radicalization. Okay. But uh, essentially, now you have power of both aspects. I think we all understand, um, uh, even in Henry's talk, you know, the, you know, the clear examples of what you can do with uh, uh, um, symbolic, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, AI and uh, uh, logic. Uh, that now we can do both, uh, you know, uh, in our uh, knowledge infused learning process. Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for that answer. That was uh, kind of that was clear. And uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Ravi, you had something on the chat. And also, uh, Amit, uh, if you can send the slides to us, that will be great uh, sure. to for it to be posted. So you can send it to Ken Baklaski as sure. a slide set. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, let me see if there's anything on the uh, chat. Uh, oh, thank you. No. The two chats, I, uh, the, uh, there is another chat page, which is uh, which another link which says some soapup.org slash conferring. Yeah, they are showing it here, I guess. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's <clears throat> Amit, I have a question. Uh, you partially answered one of my questions, mm -hmm. which was um, you have generally entities and relationships in a knowledge graph, but by adding embeddings, you enriched that knowledge graph to include concepts that you just now showed the examples of. But are there, are there, therefore you are really processing the embeddings or are you still tying yourself to um, entities and relationships that led you to those embeddings so that you don't lose out 
the atomic level of entities and the aggregate level of what you call the embeddings so in general uh, if you if your computational system is all built around some vector and uh, multidimensional space portrayed by the vector um, there is very little in that to provide something that is human understandable so the uh, value of the strategy that i showed uh, such as when you are doing um, um, let's see uh, uh, when you are uh, doing this sort of thing um, uh, as you see on the slide here that you are uh, able to link the text to the concepts that are in the knowledge graph now you have the what what it takes to do explanation so uh, we are trying we are we are building the systems where um, uh, we will come up with an explanation in a human readable form yeah or uh, or show it as a graph uh, and yeah. a point here is that here is a text that we, that originally existed but by look you look at the items in in blue those are the concepts in those are the replacement of the text by concepts in the knowledge graph and then you can argue from that that this is uh, you know uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder because it uh, talks about this and this or because there is a negation between this concept and not that concept and so um, you know we can write on the uh, sort of take the ideas from abstractive summarization and then build uh, you know a summary uh, argument or explanation for what is understood from the text uh, that then now human can understand so on one hand you have the result such as yes this is a more correct result like in this particular example the correct result is that ocd the prediction here you see is ocd uh, uh, and so you can actually if you did not use knowledge uh, i showed you that uh, very very likely the uh, the basic uh, you know models uh, language models would have given you that the answer is depression not ocd and that would be wrong <clears throat> so um, uh, it, both you are improving the uh, answers that's one part but you are able to explain it because now you know what are the concepts uh, there is a medical knowledge that you have from which you can build uh, the explanation medical knowledge says that you know in this context observes you know um, it is uh, ocd in this other context it is not ocd very good very good example you have shown because you have gone from a condition of let's say mental health to explaining it including it in a text form or in the embedded uh, symbols form yes thank you but now last question is on differentiation between knowledge understanding and uh, learning differentiation between knowledge yeah and understanding. understanding and learning i mean uh, just going to clarify, clarify on that what he wants to know is that uh, you have created these knowledge graphs so the knowledge graphs are just the semantic graphs which are, which are, which exist out there but in terms of and two things he wants to know is that what does it mean like how do you understand what it means okay like if someone has an ocd kind of thing that you have what does it mean by someone having an ocd okay so what is the implications of the of 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 uh, this particular symbol structure and the other thing is that to do, do with learning so with this knowledge graphs and with this uh, constant consultation are you going to generate new concepts here that we generated into the knowledge graph uh, ravi is that what i summarize sum summarizing your uh, statement uh -huh. pretty good yeah whether it is in relation to knowledge graph or otherwise either would be helpful yeah let thank you thank you ram yeah thank let you. me make some uh, uh, further uh, state uh, clarification and, and and details when we are talking about knowledge graph uh, yes knowledge graphs is this uh, representation entities and relationships but um, um and it can be even back of words so first of all we all know that uh, knowledge representation comes in a very wide variety from nomenclatures and taxonomies and uh, uh, you know and then we know the uh, representational richness of uh, 
uh, property graph versus uh, RDF versus OWL. All this is something uh, we are aware of, and I didn't want to go into those details there. But I do want to clarify that the moment uh, we are using knowledge graph, I'm not just showing using knowledge graph to create embedding and get done with it. I have that knowledge graph and I have the reasoning system. Just like in any symbolic AI system, I am able to reason uh, that um, a PTSD is a special case of anxiety with overlapping systems. And that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, here is a question, how come DL sum summarizer records that uh, a patient has been diagnosed with PTSD when the script says otherwise? And here, you know, you're using the knowledge and you're doing additional reasoning. So what I mean here is that we are the, in a very simplest form, you can um, take the knowledge from the knowledge graph, create a, uh, uh, a, a you know, a representation that is compatible with what the deep learning system does in AI system, the 300, you know, uh, vector of size 300. And, um, and, um, and, be done with it and that does improve the learning in the for the learning as you call learning in the deep learning that you know and which then leads that learning leads to that prediction for example so you that is one part which is a very limited view of what you can do but you have all the other power that you do when you are doing with the reasoning i mean um uh, the simple you know analogy is that uh, I would guess that in humans, we have the system one and we do perception. And then we have the system two, we do, uh, you know, cognition, we do uh, analogies, we do reasoning. The, um, the same way that is what human brain does, the knowledge infused system that I'm interested in developing does also the same, that thing in that when necessary, I'm going to the higher level of abstractions and doing the reasoning to give you the explanation in the form that humans can understand why the system worked the way it did or how you should interpret the result from the system uh, or what what does it you know why the system came up with what it came up with and that work is done at a system two level kind of thing and that is i i'm i'm mimicking that by using my uh, you know um, uh, symbolic ai uh, research uh, in paradigm and tools and whatever we have Right? So I can do abductive reasoning, I can do um, uh, inductive reasoning, uh, you know, so, so, so I can do all forms of reasoning that I have to do what I need to do for the things. And the system that we are talking about here is the one that does both. Uh, remember, in all these things, we just did not say, recognize that deep learning system has done amazing job in processing massive amount of data and get something out of it. So that benefit still remains i you know we are still talking about using uh, the deep learning uh, okay. we are talking about modifying the deep learning and connecting in different ways and what i'm say what what we also portrayed here is that uh, this connection comes in simple form with limited uh, uh, benefit and a more um, a challenge, a more uh, uh, integrated form so one is interoper interoperability versus integration so the uh, this comes with a simpler form like in shallow infusion and a deeper, highly integrated form uh, with support for uh, abstractions in the deep uh, uh, learning. And there's something called uh, semi-deep learning. Uh, these are again very broad categories. Within them, there are subcategories, just the same way Henry portrayed, you know, these six different um, uh, neuro and symbolic, uh, 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 you know, um, mashes. Uh, similarly, uh, these come in all the different varieties and we are we are creating the, these varieties in the broad classification of shallow semi deep and deep infusion and in in the as you go from uh, uh, if when you talk about semi uh, uh, shallow infusion we are limiting ourselves to um, uh, uh, you know essentially remaining in the traditional statistical ai space with uh, some small improvement uh, by use of knowledge and so we are basically uh, our ability is slightly improved for interpretability and almost nothing for explainability when we do that um, uh, 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 shallow infusion strategy. But when we go towards deep infusion strategy, 
um, uh, then we are uh, really not talking about uh, deep learning or statistic AI alone. We are talking about a combination and an integrated or hybrid or integrated form of statistical and symbolic AI. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think we're running out of time and- uh, I think uh, Sudharam, Sudharam yeah. has a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, can I can I ask a quick question? Thank you. Um, no. I type. Do you, do we have just a couple of minutes? Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you, Amit and Henry. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. I had a question about, uh, you know, how this neurosymbolic approach or embedding knowledge graphs can act. I can see that it helps with abstractions. Uh, because the knowledge graph has abstractions in it, right? Lower level concepts and, you know, super classes and so on and relationships. But what about analogies? Uh, you know, the, the, basically the human thinking, one big part of us being able to reason is using analogies. Uh, how does this neurosymbolic approach or even incorporating knowledge graphs kind of tackle this problem of analogies? Very, uh, I'm so glad you asked this question. This uh, we have actually a project on uh, uh, automatically uh, identifying analogies uh, using uh, the knowledge infused learning. So this actually happens to be an active area of research. Uh, we are working with educators, in particularly uh, instructors uh, in undergrad uh, that are that teach undergraduate biology and uh, uh, biochemistry courses. And so uh, there is a uh, a colleague, uh, somebody I know, collaborator we have who has uh, uh, over the years um, uh, used analogy in his classroom and had students uh, develop analogies. Uh, so you can describe a biochemical process through a sports analogy or analogy of uh, firefighters going to drowse mm -hmm. a fire. Uh, and these analogies, uh, there's a large, you know, they, they just build a decent corpus of these analogies. And we have been working on um, essentially uh, creating mechanisms to uh, 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 first um, uh, develop a system to, and there's a, you know, actually pending a, a proposal um, uh, to, uh, uh, and to, to help teachers uh, decide whether the analogies are good or how good or partially good and how good and what aspects of the a learning material is captured in analogy and what it is missing. And then later on, we uh, we plan to go towards uh, actually um, uh, creating analogies, uh, you know, uh, in the, so it's just like we have transfer learning, we are talking about a transfer learning applied to analogical, uh, you know, analogies. And that's a very exciting uh, area. And uh, uh, if you're interested, well, let's, let's uh, you know, talk about it offline. I'd be happy to share. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah, thank you. Because I think this is a particularly challenging problem in AI reasoning. And, you know, if you read about what Andrew Karpathy says, he says we're really far, far away from this kind of reasoning. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it, it is a very complex problem. Yeah, it is one of the more difficult ones that uh, we, are, uh, we are working on. Pretty, pretty challenging, yes, indeed. But... Uh, I am hopeful that given that I have knowledge graph for chemistry and biochemistry and biology, and given that I have knowledge graph um, or DBpedia for this other domain, that I, you know, just the same way I showed you the, this particular graph, uh, you know, here where things get annotated with different, um, you know, ontology, uh, a very simple answer is uh, uh, that we'll take um, uh, uh, text one, and the analogical text too. For the text one with the relevant uh, domain model, we will uh, understand uh, instantiation of concepts. Text two with the role relevant domain model, which could be sports or, uh, ontology, understand uh, concepts there, and then look at the structures, the subgraph structures of the two. And the analogy is partially, not fully, supported by having similar uh, structures and you know here is the lead concept here's the lead concept and that around that um, there is this scaffolding and there is similar scaffolding the other side and that is how you can get uh, uh, so that's the intuition okay again uh, thanks a lot Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, amit because we are a little bit running out of time i know if you had time you would have given answered uh, uh, 
uh, Ravi's other question of mindfulness, uh, how can you convert your symbolic knowledge structures like mantras into mindfulness? But that's a topic of another discussion, for, uh, <laughs> talk. So anyway, thanks again. And uh, we appreciate both Henry and uh, Amit for taking their time and giving excellent talks. And thank you again for the audience for asking those insightful questions. Uh, so until next time, maybe the next neuro symbolic uh, uh, session is, I guess, May 5th, uh, where uh, we have, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess uh, we have two speakers uh, at that time. Uh, one, I believe, is from IBM, another from MIST. So you can look into the website and, and see. And, uh, and you can see again all the, those people talking. Uh, we'll have links to the talks we had today. So, with that, uh, Ken, I'm, go I'm going to uh, hand over the session to you. Thank you, Rob. Uh and uh, next week, um, Leah Dickerson will be speaking. Um, so please come. Its um, title is Integrating Sustainability into Ontology Development, the Case of GAO's Fraud Ontology. Hmm. So next week, same time, um, please join us. And thank you all. Okay. Again, I mean, thank this you. is recorded and it will be on the website. Great. Looking forward to that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.